Well, good evening, and it's good to be back again with you tonight as we continue in our series of studies into the subject of the servant of the Lord, the servant of Jehovah, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is unfolded to us in the Gospel of Mark. We've identified in our first study when we thought about the significance of the servant of the Lord, we identified that there are four Gospels that each of the four Gospels has a distinct emphasis. Matthew, the emphasis is on the kingship of Christ. Luke, on the fact that he is the Son of Man and his humanity is to the fore. John emphasizes the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Mark is the Gospel of the Servant. And uh, we have been seeking to learn from Mark's Gospel on these things, not exclusively from Mark. We draw light from other places and other scriptures to focus on these aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been looking at the prophecy of Isaiah very much because there we find the servant's songs. Uh, those passages of scripture in poetic form that look forward to and anticipate the Lord Jesus Christ in his messianic ministry and that ministry particularly as the servant of the Lord. That the Lord Jesus Christ, co-equal with the Father, co-eternal with the Father, yet became subservient to the will of his Father in coming into the world and gladly became a human, adding his humanity to his deity, that he in his life on earth might obtain that salvation that we so much needed and we are thankful tonight for his submission that was the second thing that we looked at the submissiveness of the servant and we thought about that particularly in the context of his baptism why was he baptized to fulfill all righteousness this was the plan of God from eternity and in fulfilling the plan of God, in obedience to his Father, the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized as, as it were, an anticipation of his substitutionary work. He's standing in and bearing the sins of his people. He will do that ultimately and fully on the cross. But there is that anticipation of it in his baptism, his death and burial and resurrection. Then, of course, we went on to think about the sympathy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we took that wonderful word that appears a number of times in Mark's Gospel, and we thought about the compassion of Jesus. Here in his earthly work and his ministry, he is seen with great tenderness carrying out the purposes that were given to him by the Father. It's good to have a sympathetic Savior, one who cares for us, one who watches over us, provides for us, guides us, simply because he loves us. And he is our shepherd. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. And we're glad tonight that the shepherd gave his life for the sheep. We are glad to join with David so, so many years ago and declare that affirmative message, the Lord is my shepherd. And tenderness, compassion, sympathy, epitomize his shepherding work. We are turning tonight to the passage that again was read for us in Mark chapter 15. But before going there, there are two passages of scripture I want to take you to, first of all, again to Isaiah chapter 53. Remember we said that there are these four, perhaps five, maybe more servant song passages in Isaiah. The best known of them probably is that which begins in Isaiah 52, 13 and goes right through to the end of chapter 53. And uh, the Lord in his word, almighty God in his word, tells us to behold my servant. And then there is this unfolding of this great prophetic passage that takes us in Old Testament terms right to the cross. Turn to Isaiah 53 and to verse 4. 
And let us think about these words. I think we all know them tonight. I trust we do. If you are fairly new to the Bible, get to know this great passage. Get to see Christ in it. Understand the way in which Christ is there in all the scriptures. And if we cannot see him here, then I, I fear we'll see him nowhere. He is most beautifully and most wonderfully set forth. Listen to these words. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now with that little thought in mind, come down to verse 10 of the same passage, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10. And note with me these words, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Those are some of the most outstanding words in the whole Bible. Some of the most amazing thoughts are derived from what we read there and at the same time some of the most mysterious things that even the most well-educated Christian the most deeply spiritual believer will have to stand back and say there are depths to that that I cannot fully comprehend the cross was not man's idea it was God's it was not at the initiative of man that Christ was crucified, so much as the initiative of Almighty God. This is the fulfilling of a plan, the plan of redemption, spawned in the heart of God before the creation of the world. And when we look back to Calvary, we realize that whatever man is doing there, and man is doing something there undoubtedly, and shamefully man is doing something there. But God is doing something. And Isaiah characterizes it like this. He is stricken and smitten of God. God is doing something. But then to anchor that in those words, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That takes us into another dimension altogether. Now we're not saying, and God forbid that we should be mistaken as saying, that, God's to, that God took some kind of, of wrongful pleasure in the death of his son. In other words, we're not saying that God is deriving a sadistic pleasure in the death of his son. And yet there is something in the compass of that word that lets us know God was doing this, doing it deliberately because he wanted to do it, because he intended to do it, and it fulfilled his will entirely to do it, and to do it to his son. And therein is the mystery. Why would God the Father want to deal so with his only begotten son. And that poses one of the greatest mysteries that the human mind can ever contemplate. Now with those verses in mind, as we anchor this in the suffering servant song of Isaiah, think again of Philippians chapter 2, if you will. We've looked at this already, but we want to come a little bit further than we've come before. And Paul is exhorting the people at Philippi concerning their proud and arrogant outlook, their wrongful behavior, the way that they're treating each other, uh, and their lack of humility, their lack of lowliness of mind. And in order to drive home his message, he takes the greatest example of humility and he directs their minds to Christ and he directs them to the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The deity of Christ is there, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. 
and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now just pause there for a moment and think about one word with me, will you? It's the word even. Even the death of the cross. Paul is not just simply saying he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. He's wanting us to see what kind of death that was. He's wanting us to contemplate something of what that death at Calvary really meant. He's exposing us to the fact that there's something about that death that signals that that death is different from any other death ever entered into. Nobody, but nobody died like this. Oh yes, other people died the death of the cross. Multitudes did. There was hardly a highway that you would traverse in Israel at the time of the Roman Empire, but that you would see many crosses standing at the roadside. Those who had been found guilty of breach of Roman law were put to death in an ignominious, a shameful way for a Jew, and they were put to death in agonizing fashion. It was humiliating, it was agonizing, it was evident at every hand. Yes, many people died on a cross. There was no uniqueness in the fact that Christ died on a cross. But there is uniqueness in his death on a cross. And what we're wanting to do tonight in the subject that we're coming to, we're wanting to approach it with really bated breath and a deep sense of reverence. We need to have a holy solemnity about us tonight. A holy solemnity that ought to attend our every thought of the cross. That should be with us in our daily lives when we think of what it meant to make us the sons and daughters of God. We should have it in our minds when we come to worship because all of our worship ultimately is available to us simply because of the cross. We ought to have it very deeply in our minds when we come to remember the Lord in his own appointed way as we simply take bread and wine in obedience to his command. Even the death of the cross. In all our study of these events, we have to acknowledge that there are depths that are far too deep for us to properly understand. There are aspects that are too mystifying for our minds to grasp. There are marvels that are too wondrous for us to really deal with as we would love to be able to do. But the very fulcrum upon which our reconciliation with God turns is what happened at Calvary. All the teachings, all the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, though marvelous, though wonderful as they are, by themselves cannot obtain the needed salvation that we know is necessary for us. To be sure in his life, the Lord Jesus Christ is all the while obtaining that righteousness that we need. His life is vital as is his death. But there's something about the death that says to us, though his life was perfect and perfect obedience, though his life was all that we could not live before God, as he lived it out in honoring his father, in obeying his father, in obtaining for us the righteousness that we needed to cover us before God, though that is true, yet without the cross, we are still left sinners. We continue without hope because we needed a mediator who while being able to lay hold both upon God as God and man as man, we needed a mediator who would satisfy the justice of God completely. God must 
judge sin. To not judge sin would be inconsistent with his character. It just cannot be. We contend with many aspects of the great nature of God, the characteristics of God, the perfections of God. We contend with them as we try to understand them, as we try to come to a proper uh, affiliation with them. But so many try to assess God, try to derive their understanding of the character of God apart from understanding and accepting the wrath of God. And while we're thankful for grace and mercy and love and while we're thankful for all of those other aspects of the character of God that warm our hearts and stir our souls, yet we cannot take them in isolation from the fact of the justice of God, the righteousness of God, the wrath of God. And that's the kind of direction that I think we need to take tonight. In order to satisfy the justice of God to completion, an atoning blood shedding sacrifice is absolutely necessary. It is demanded by God. It is anticipated throughout the Old Testament right from the gateway to Eden. And it's now in our passage tonight about to be fulfilled. And those words of Isaiah verse 4 verse 12 of chapter 53 epitomize the matter smitten of God and afflicted. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. The initiative is Jehovah's. The means is the servant of Jehovah. And so with reverence and thankfulness let us draw near to the cross as Mark unfolds these events. I want to try and be very simple tonight and very straightforward. There are aspects to this that defy ultimate simplicity, I know. There are theological aspects, there are implications that we could well identify with. But I suggest in the light of our series, those are going to be best left to another environment, another time. I'm not investigating every aspect of this tonight. <coughs> All that I'm wanting to do is get to one phrase. That's all I'm going to do. First of all in the Aramaic. Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani. And for our edification translated. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? That's where we're headed. And we need to now, as it were, just still our souls and enter the gates of divine revelation with the prayer, Lord, speak to me, that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. Notice with me, please, first of all, the context of this episode. There's something supernatural about the context. As we read it there, we saw that there is this darkness that descends. At Jesus' birth, there was a brightness that dispelled the darkness of midnight. The angels of glory were there attendant with all the resplendent brightness of heaven with them. What a night that must have been for those shepherds. What a frightening night. A night that stayed in their memory till the day they died. But it was bright. But now at the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is darkness at midday. It's as though the son is ashamed to look on Jesus. It's as though the son is refusing to lend its warmth to him in the chill moments of his death on that center tree. The darkness, I think, is meant to remind us of several things. 
Uh, more than I will mention perhaps, but let me mention just two. I think that the darkness is going to take us back to a time many, many years before that when the children of Israel yet in bondage in the land of Egypt were about to be delivered. Now you and I know that they were delivered after the plague of the death of the firstborn. A plague which then eventually gave rise to the great feast of the Israelites known as the Passover. Known as the Passover because in God's injunction to his people, they were told to take the blood of a lamb one year without spot, without blemish, and apply it to the doorposts and the lintel of the home using hyssop. The great Passover was very important. And in many ways it is important to us. I'll speak to that just briefly in a moment. What was the plague before it? The plague immediately before it was the plague of darkness. And I doubt not that this event at the cross is meant to take us back to remind us of what happened in the land of Egypt to the Israelites. There was darkness over the land. And in the wake of that darkness, deliverance by the Passover. And here again we have darkness. And here again we have the, pa the Passover, of which that was but an anticipation. Christ, our Passover, is crucified for us. So I think that that's in vogue here. I think there may be one other thing that we need to keep in mind. I'm not turning you to it, I'm just mentioning it on the way into our theme. And that is the book of Amos. Maybe you know those Old Testament books well. Some of those minor prophets are difficult for us to find. You know those little expressions that people used to use, happiness is, you know, happiness is, and then they give something that describes and defines happiness. Happiness for people in church is sitting beside somebody who knows where Amos is. And that way you can turn to Amos quite quickly as somebody else gets there with you. Well, Amos, one of those great Old Testament passages, one of those great Old Testament books, takes us to this scene, I think, because perhaps in an even more powerful and even more poignant way, the words in the closing chapters of Amos are very important. In that day, I will make the sun to go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Now, now let me say very quickly, because I know there are good Bible scholars here who would upbraid me very quickly if they thought that I was out of place here. Is not Amos talking about the great day of judgment at the end of time? And the answer to that is yes, he is. But in reminding those people of the great judgment of God at the end of time, will you not agree with me that he's reminding us of something that you and I as believers will not have to endure? We will not have that judgment. Why? Because that judgment was taken by Christ and in the darkness of that hour, Amos' prophecy is being fulfilled for us. On our part. And so I think that this is a remarkable event because God's projected thinking is to do with judgment, is to do with deliverance, is to do with bloodshedding, is to do with sacrifice. And all of those things are coming together with other great themes as well. Was it an eclipse? No. There is no sense in which this could have been an eclipse of the sun. Simply because of the fact it lasted for three hours. Simply because even science will tell us that there was no eclipse at all at that particular time. We don't need an eclipse. God sometimes uses ordinary means to achieve extraordinary ends. I don't doubt that. God doesn't always work with a miracle, as we would say, something that is distinctly different beyond uh, the norm. But very often God does work miracles. He's the God of miracles. He's a miracle-working God. 
we have no problem with that here tonight. Surely we've got no problem with that. We believe that God, who is the creator of all things, has the right to step in and do with his creation precisely what he wants to do. You know, I, I, I smile at the, uh, the questions that are raised about a six-day creation that God created in six days of all things. And people say, you know, that's far too short a period of time. You've maybe seen the little cartoon, have you? The little cartoon with the little lad hearing the objections to the six-day creation, and he says, my problem is I wonder how he took so long. You see, God could have done it in a split second. He chose six days because he's teaching lessons. There are lessons to be learned from the very beginning of all things. And God can do just what God wants to do. When we see this darkness, we're not looking for something that man can explain away. We're saying quite simply, God did it. This miracle. God did it. He as it were placed his hand over the sun and he said, You will not shine on my sun at this time. Something supernatural. Let me say there's something significant about the context. Three o'clock in the afternoon, about the time of the slaying, the offering of the daily sacrifice, at that very time, darkness descends. And those sacrifices, those day-by-day -day sacrifices, as part of God's prophetic anticipation of that which Christ is now doing, those sacrifices were ongoing at that very time. And the Jews say that every day the daily sacrifice was slain at eight and a half and was offered up at nine and a half. That's right in the midst of the time that we're thinking about here. And God brings this miracle to bear. God is setting this in the context of the fact that this, that Christ is doing, is a sacrifice. That's as simple as I can put it. A sacrifice is required. The justice of God requires it. Judgment to be enacted requires it. It's a sacrifice. And it's telling us something about what God is doing. The second thing. The contempt by the enemies, just very, very briefly. The context of the episode, the contempt by the enemies. And the first thing I want you to see from verse 35 of Mark chapter 15 is the crass perversion of the thinking of these people. They try to make out that Jesus Christ is calling for Elijah. They knew Hebrew, they knew Aramaic, and they knew Psalm 22. The first verse of which is being quoted by Jesus at this time. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They knew it. Oh, they knew it. They knew their Bible far better than... We know the Old Testament, sadly. They knew the Psalms very, very well. They knew exactly what was being said here. And they were mocking Christ. It was cruel to do what they were doing. And there in the midst of that thick darkness, they're trying to get under the skin of Christ and make a laughing stock out of him. Even there in such terrible agony as he is enduring. What is this Nazarene on about now? What's he doing? What's he saying? But Christ is deliberately quoting the opening words of that psalm. One of the great messianic psalms. They knew that. And they were pretending that the people couldn't understand what he was saying. Now out of the many things that they're doing there, by the way, the most serious thing that they're doing is suggesting that Christ is praying to the saints. He's praying to Elijah. And that, of course, would not be countenanced in their thinking. Christ was not praying to Elijah. Christ was praying to his God. 
And so that is mixed, not only the crass perversion, but it's mixed with their cruel practice in verse 36. Give him a drink and then we'll understand him better, they're saying. And so it's done, a sponge of rough wine is offered to the Lord and a stick. It's all part of the mockery. Let him alone, they say. Leave him alone. That's what million, millions of people say all over the world today. Leave him alone. Don't have anything to do with him. Just forget him. He's just a fool. Um, we'll see whether Elias will come and take him down. And if he doesn't, then we'll conclude that even Elias has abandoned him. One gave him vinegar to drink. He ran to get it. I think he must have felt himself very self-important having this task to do. To go and get a sponge and put it on a stick and try and get the Lord Jesus Christ to get vinegar to drink. But it's all to do with abuse. It's all to do with insult. And so we come now to the content of the expression. We've set the scene. We've come into it slowly, gradually, getting the understanding of what this is all about. What Calvary is about, what God is doing, what we're to understand by these events. You may have heard of Harry Arnside. Old Harry Arnside has some quaint and remarkable things to say in his time. But I came across this and I thought he, he captured the thinking very, very well indeed. Let me quote. Observe it was the Lord God himself who dealt with Christ in judgment when he hung upon the tree. It was not his physical sufferings alone that made propitiation for sin. But what he endured in his innermost being when his holy spotless soul became the great sin offering. In other words, it was not what man did to him that made reconciliation for iniquity, but what he endured at the hand of God, leading to Emmanuel's orphan cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Unquote. And I think it captures very well for me what I'm trying to say to you tonight, and I feel myself very inadequate. We often home in on the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ and we think about the crown of thorns. We think about the face that was smitten and that was battered. And we think about the spittle running down his cheek. We think about the back lashed to pulp with that cruelest of weapons that was used by the Roman legion. We gaze on the hands and the feet riven through with nails and we think about the spear riven side. And all of those things are horrific. Not one of us would deny. His visage marred more than any man's. It's terrible. It's awful to think about. It's awful for any person. But who is this? This is the Lord of glory. This is God manifest in the flesh. This is the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. He did no sin. There was no evil thought in his mind. No wrongful word ushered from his lips. He's pure, absolutely pure. And there he is hanging, bleeding on a cross as people laugh and mock. And now as the darkness comes upon it, the physical agony of Christ is more than we can contemplate. And the mental anguish of Christ. Who is he? I say again. He is the Lord of glory. He is the word by whom all things were made. He is the great creator. And there before him are his own very creatures. And he's allowing them to deal with him thus. And he's observing them in their mockery and in all their antagonism. And it's there in his mind and it's going into his thoughts in a way that we can't possibly understand. But that is nowhere near the worst. Because when man had done his worst, then God took over. And he dealt with his son according to our sins. That's the worst. 
And out of all the things that emanate from the lips of Jesus, surely this tonight touches us in a way that nothing else could. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Three hours from nine in the morning till midday. The crowds who shouted their taunts at him have gone away. And there is just one more body hanging on a cross. And their curiosity is satisfied and home they go. But after that three hours of silence and darkness, the cry of the twenty second psalm. There's nothing, nothing that I can find to guide our thoughts into this. There's nothing in our own experience that comes remotely close to what's happening here. These levels at which we can try now to unravel things still leaves us with mysteries as to what Jesus means and what he intends by these words. He's the God-man. He is son in an eternal sense. There was never a time when the son was not. He has an absolutely unique relationship with his father in heaven. We know that. He is equal with him as far as essence is concerned. As much God as the Father is God, as much God as the Holy Spirit is God. And yet distinct from the Father, distinct from the Holy Spirit. The theologians try to help us a little bit. And they point out that within this one God there is a differentiation. The Father begat the Son, and the Son is begotten of the Father. And there is a consciousness in the part of Jesus, the incarnate Son, that he has a divine consciousness. And he bears a unique relationship with the Father in heaven. I cannot understand Trinity. I cannot understand it. I believe it with all my heart. Like last night, it's something that I'm prepared to live and die for. The triune God, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I cannot comprehend it. It's beyond my ability. Nor can I understand what the theologian calls the hypostatic union. The union of two natures in one person, human and divine. I can't understand that. But it com comes clear to me across the word of God that the Lord Jesus Christ is human. He became human. He took human flesh and blood, a human soul. Throughout his life he is conscious that he is human. But he's also conscious that he's divine. He could say things like, I and my father are one, couldn't he? He could say things like, before Abraham was, I am. He can say things like this 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, not my father, my father. He seems to be saying that he is robed now, as it were, of his divine nature, his native sonship. He can no longer appeal to that unique relationship that he had in fellowship, communion with his father. He cannot now on the cross say, Abba. He can't say it. And it seems to me that it suggests that at last the veil of sin, imputed sin, my sin, your sin, our sin, has caused the light of the countenance of his father, the smile of his father, to be obliterated altogether. It's not that he's doubting the father's love, not at all. It's just that he's no longer aware of it. He's not conscious of it. He's not conscious that his father is there to help him. He's not assured of the victorious outcome of this event. As I said just briefly on our first visit to this series, it seems from those prophetic passages that it's all failed. That's how it feels. That's how Jesus feels.
We need to be careful when we tread on holy ground like this. Because it doesn't mean that the father was not there helping him. It doesn't mean that he wasn't supplying the spirit in a mysterious way, in a way that you and I cannot understand or fathom in this overwhelming flood as the waves and the billows of the anger of God go over him. It's by the spirit, you see, that he offered himself without spot unto God. This is a quotation. We've said that already. And yet in a sense it's not a quotation. Because he's the author of scripture and he's actually just reciting his own words that he gave through David. He speaks in Aramaic, not Greek or Hebrew, the language of the common people. There's a deliberate work in reciting this psalm. There is something of reality here. He is experiencing the abandonment of God in the very depth of his soul. Not only is he suffering in his body, he's suffering in his soul. John Calvin put it this way. If Christ had only died a bodily death, it would have been ineffectual. Unless his soul shared in the punishment, he would have been the redeemer of our bodies alone. And that's where the mystery lies. Did you come tonight thinking that I could explain each detail and every aspect of this? I can't. I just bow my head before God and say that which is a mystery to me is the most wonderful mystery that my mind can possibly look to. And I can only bow humbly before God and say thank God for Jesus and what he endured in that time. One commentator put it this way, he has been cast out. It seems as though his soul is outside of the embrace of covenant love and reassurance. He is in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's under the anathema of the covenant. He is descending into hell, at least in Calvin's sense of it. That is, he is experiencing the unmitigated wrath of God. There's only one word that I can bring to bear, and it's the best word that I can think of. It's the word substitution. What I deserved, he took. what I deserved he took I've just got to say one thing beyond that and I don't know why why oh God such love to me I will never understand it has to be all of grace there is not one tiny minuscule part of me that deserves what Jesus did on that cross. Nothing. What he endured is what should have happened to me. And so he asks this question. And again, we need to be careful. He is saying why, but we dare not suggest for one moment that he is questioning the right of God to do what he did. He's not. That's not what he's doing. These words must mean that Christ was forsaken. They must mean what they say. That the Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken at that very moment. He'd always been with the Father. In the beginning, the word was with God. All the way through his earthly life, God had been there for Jesus, as it were, to appropriate. He and the Father fellowship together in a way that we can't understand. God was always there to communicate with him. God was always there to rejoice with him in his rejoicing. God was there to be thanked at the end of each day for the mercies that Jesus experienced new every morning. 
He was sustained every day. He felt loved and he loved in return. There never was, as someone put it, a sweeter father and there never was a more loving son. God knew what he was doing and Christ is not abrading him at all. He understands. This is why he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. Many years ago, and I give this little personal illustration, it's, it's like all illustrations, it falls short. But many years ago, our son was required to go into hospital for an operation. He's just a little lad and he was required to go into theatre and have an operation. I'm not sure that my wife is going to forgive me for using this illustration. But it nearly broke her heart to put him through it. When he came out he said, Mummy, why did you let them do that to me? It wasn't easily understood by a child. The answer was because it was necessary. And I don't think for one moment but that the father felt something like that. When we read it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I think we can equally say it broke his heart at the same time. God provided a special lamb, not an animal, but one that came from his own bosom. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Justice is satisfied. The demands of a holy God are met. And that's where that little question takes us. He suffered that we might go free. A centurion stood at the cross. He watched and he heard and he listened. And his life was changed that day. He was no longer the same. 2,000 years ago it was that Jesus died and the cry of his lips was sent forth. But by God's great grace and mercy, there was a day in my life when I was brought to the cross. And I knew my sin. And thank God that day I came to know my Savior. I have not been as I ought to have been, nor lived as I ought to have lived. What a disappointment I have been. But he knew all that before he died for me. He didn't die because of what I was. He didn't die because of what I would try to be. He died because he loved me. Grace, tis a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Oh, isn't it good to be saved tonight? Isn't it good to know Jesus? I can add nothing. I fear that words that I will say will but detract from the simplicity of what he said. May the Lord help us to understand it more fully. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let us pray.
Our God and our Father, we stumble and stutter and we try to, as it were, get a hold of these things. And we cannot fully comprehend. But what we pray, Lord, is not so much that we may be enabled to get a hold on these things, though we pray for better understanding as time goes on. But we do pray, Lord, that these things will get a hold of us and that the reality of the suffering of Christ in his soul will deeply influence our living day by day until we see him face to face and fall prostrate before him and crown him Lord of all. Amen.